How's it going, everyone? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Junluca, aka Dr. Calcano, and I'm a final year medical resident working and studying in Canada right now. And today we're going to have just a little bit of an informal chat. There's no script or anything made up. I have a few points written down here, but I just wanted to talk because uh, recently I had a discussion with some medical students that were applying for residency. And I think that a lot of these questions, I remember going through medical school and it was difficult trying to find someone to ask these questions in many cases. So I want to do maybe a couple of these videos going over you know, what it's like now at the end of my family medicine residency or, or being in my last year anyways, and getting ready to find a job. I feel like in many cases, we don't talk about the fact that you actually get to go to work after school eventually. So a little bit of a recap, because I don't think I've checked in with people in a while. It is November right now, and in your final year of your medical residency for family medicine, what that means is for most people, there's only one thing left to do. Um, well, you finish up your end of residency research project that's mandatory that we all submit uh, and do a presentation on that we've been doing for the last year and a half and then we all get ready for our canadian licensing exams now for me i'm also going to be writing the usmle step three and that's going to happen around the same time um but but usually that, that's the last part we finish up all of our rotations then we have our electives and then the last four months of our residency normally we all take to study for the exam and then start planning where we're actually going to go to work now what that looks like is variable and many of my friends and colleagues don't exactly know for sure where they're going yet. I do. That's just the way that I, I work. I like to plan things far in advance. I like to have about a five year plan and I knew uh, coming into residency what I wanted to do kind of, but after the first year I was pretty dead set and knew exactly what was going on. And uh, that's what we're talking about, just different options. I've talked about before that family medicine is one of the most varied specialties. There are so many different jobs that you could do. Uh, let's go over some of the options, okay? So we'll break down just the most common ones that I've come across and that people have approached me for so far and then some of the pros and cons of them. And then you guys get to decide if you're ever in this place, if any of these suit your interests. But the most common one by far is getting into family medicine clinic, doing work in a family medicine clinic. And to that extent, there are basically three different options. Either you are going into personal practice or you're gonna be a locum or you're gonna work in walk-in clinics. For the most part, that's what that section of this conversation looks like. Now, of those different options, I would say that most people coming out of family medicine residency, unfortunately, get into locum work right away. They, they're reluctant to take on a practice at first, most people that I've talked to. One of the reasons is, is because um, locum work is very flexible. Like you could choose to pick up a two week or a four week stint and then get a month or two months of vacation afterwards or you get as many months as you want until you book another locum ship. Like there's no, once the locum expires, you could take, you know, a month and go to Europe. And as long as, as you want to not work, you have the option to do that. There's no requirement that says that you have to work intensively in that first year. The downsides of locum work though, is that uh, the less you work, the less money you make. And after coming out of medical school and residency, that's not in a situation that I want to be at because life gets expensive really, really fast when you start getting hit with all those interest payments. And then we'll talk about that more in the future. The next piece is the whole walk-in clinic aspect. Some people might like it. There are different ways that you could go about it. You could choose to work in a scenario where it's fee for service uh, and you're billing every patient that you see and then maybe the place that you stay will take a percentage out for overhead or there are different ways that you can set that up. The last option is to get into personal practice. And what that means is that basically you're taking your roster. You are setting up your own practice. You're going to enroll people in your roster if you're going to be doing an FHO model. And if not, you'll be doing fee for service. This one here has the benefit of being one of the most lucrative of this initial category with the downside is that you get maximum responsibility right out of the gate. This is a option that is good for people that are ready um, to manage your business uh, because that's what it means to get into family medicine clinic as well as see people on a consistent basis. Now, you do get vacation when you have your own roster. The ministry requires, I believe it's six weeks of vacation per year. It changes depending on what the stipulations of your contract are. If you're going into work with other people that like you have the option to go into private practice by yourself, totally by yourself, build the building and just get right to it. Hire your own staff. You will get crushed in administrative fees and overhead charges. Ideally, what you want to do is come together with different people and run your practice that way to divide up the overhead. That's one of the most feasible ways, but there's different payment models. And if you're going to join another practice with maybe seven doctors working already, you guys agree to all see each other's patients and they say how much vacation you can realistically take. That's how that works for the most part. Now, the other bonus with going into personal practice, especially if you're gonna establish your own practice, is that when you are getting into it, certain cities 
offer monetary incentives for you to come there. And that's just my sell to everyone. If you're looking to get into like private personal practice afterwards, um, there is there is almost no reason I would say to enter a situation where you have to buy someone else's practice and get hit with that fee right out of the gate um, in this current environment because everyone is looking for family doctors these days the job market is red hot and if you're if you're a little bit worried for the finances go somewhere where they are going to give you a sum of money especially in the beginning to help with the cost because many people don't know the first i think it's three months couple months that you're working as a doctor you don't get paid from OHIP. They back pay you three months, they hold that, uh, and then they will retroactively pay you for those three months that you're working. But the overhead charges will continue to incur in that time. So having a little bit of a bonus from a city to help establish your place is, is very necessary in the beginning. All right, moving on. Option two, you have specialty clinics. So if you choose to run a men's health clinic, a weight loss clinic, a memory clinic, a driver's physical clinic, any combination of these, if you have a particular interest in family medicine, you can choose to do some of these without any additional plus one training program. Like if you wanna run a memory clinic in the community and see elderly patients with their families and help with diagnosis of dementia and help with supports and arranging for that in their house, uh, you it's well within your scope of practice. You will get referrals from other doctors in the area that need that support. And there's a great service to be able to provide the patients and their families. Now, it might not be as lucrative as some of the other options, but it allows you to focus your practice and do something that you really enjoy, if that's something that you enjoy. The downside is that for those of you like me, maybe that <laughs> might find doing the same thing over and over again, super monotonous, it might not be the best in, in terms of where you your interests lie. Option three is emergency medicine. Now this one here is interesting because really until I got into family medicine, like you don't know just how many emergency room centers here in Canada are run by family doctors. Before the emergency five-year program was a thing, um, everyone was a family doctor that, that ran the emergency departments for the most part because family medicine as a program wasn't around. In any case, the five-year emergency medicine option is not the only way to end up an emergency room doctor. Now, in addition, there is the plus one year. So you could do a two-year family medicine training program and then a plus one and then write the exam and be certified as a family medicine doctor, specialist in emergency care. But that's not the only way either. What you could also do is choose to work rural eMERGE and why this is an option. Now, if you think about it, there are so many emergency departments in Canada that are closing on a regular basis or they can't have them staffed to be open. So as a result, because there are not enough people to fill these positions, there are openings for family doctors to go and work. And usually what happens is there's something like a mentorship program in some of these centers where you will go um, and work with a doctor that has already been at that center for a number of years. And you'll have two doctors on shift, whereas normally the shift is, is one doctor for the entire rural center. It's both of you and you're working together and there might be some additional courses that they have you take as well. Um, but after a little bit of a probation period, when you and your employer are comfortable that yes, you're able to manage by yourself, then you begin working as a family doctor in the emergency room without needing to write the exam, without needing to do a formal plus one. You can choose to do rural eMERGE and it can be lucrative, but it's exhausting. And many shifts could be between 12 and 24 hours. So 24 hours paid pretty well, I would say. And the great part about emergency medicine is that there is very little to no overhead. The downside is that there is a reason why there is a five-year emergency medicine specialty. And there is a reason why there is a plus one specialty with an exam. And if you are not comfortable in that environment, if there are things that you do not know, you might be setting yourself up for failure. So that's why if you're interested in this route, what you need to do or what you need, what you should be doing is in residency, look into doing some emergency medicine electives and additional training, and then look into doing some electives specifically with the centers that you have in mind to see what it takes to actually work at that center comfortably. All right, the next ones I'm gonna brush through a little bit more quickly. We're gonna put three together here. Now keep in mind that each of these three has a formal additional training period if you want to pursue it. But depending on where you're working, and if you're working rurally especially, you don't need technically to have that formal training program. There are definitely people that do, uh, specifically care of the elderly, that do uh, family medicine with OB, and that do palliative medicine combined with family medicine without a formal additional training program, even though they all exist. Now, again, these are all like specialized family medicine. If you're going to do family medicine palliative care, for example, Mostly, like, you're not running your own office. Many people don't anyways. You're working primarily in a hospital setting, being someone that is consultant 
to do palliative care for, for patients that are approaching end of life. Same thing with care of the elderly. You could choose to work at either a long-term care home or a retirement home, a private center or a publicly funded center. All of these places require people to go and work there and, and there's just not enough specialists to go around. So yes, depending on where you're gonna work, there, there's much work to be had, especially in care of the elderly, if I could just say. Um, when you're focusing more on OB, the way that model works for the most part is that you will typically join a practice or a group of family doctors who do OB. And then what they do is they have a, like a building together. Normally they all work together. They see a bunch of patients that are referred to them and then they divide up their call such that a different one of them is on call every single night of the week and every day of the week as well. And you are responsible for all the deliveries on that particular day. Pros and cons of these ones here is that it, it will largely depend on how you choose to work and where your interests lie. Um, palliative medicine, for example, if that is all that you're doing, can be quite emotionally taxing and draining and requires you to be present with families every single day. Incredibly important, but as someone that did an elective in it myself, I, I found that on the other side of that, it, it definitely, if, if that's all you're exposed to every single day for multiple hours per day, if you're that type of person that's a little bit more sensitive to that stuff, myself included, it, it was rough sometimes. So I'll, I'll just leave it at there. OB, being on call multiple times per week for an entire day, you have to wake up in the middle of the night and go in and it's, it, it, it's long hours and it's, it's hard work. It's not guaranteed. Um, in terms of definite, you know, nine to five type thing. It will depend once again on where your interests lie, but, but it's amazing work if you're interested in that. And some of the happiest times in medicine is when a new baby comes into the world, right? But on the other hand, some of the worst times in medicine are, are also when outcomes don't go the way that you want. Next is an interesting one, uh, I find anyways, surgical assisting. To, to you, you get your family medicine residency completed and then you just become a full-time surgical assist. Now, you don't have to be a full-time surgical assist. You could certainly run your own office and then only do surgical assist for a little bit of extra money two or three times per week or even once a week, whatever it is that you're interested in. But I do know people that are full-time surgical assists because many people don't know, but you need to be an MD to be a surgical assist for, for the most part. Like you, you could be a nurse or a different individual working in healthcare that does certain things in surgery, but as a surgical assist to actually work with the surgeon and hold all of the instruments the way that they want and uh, help with suturing and closing and transportation, you, you need to be an MD for that job. And the pros of that is that there's hardly any paperwork. There's almost no responsibility in terms of um, seeing patients regularly and following up on different labs. Like you're just there to assist, you clock in, you clock out. The downside is it's, it's not as lucrative as the other ones. And, and all this should make sense, right? Like the less you work, the less you get paid. And I've talked about this concept before, but each of these things, that's, that's what you should be taking home in terms of what are the highest paying ones and what are some of the lowest paying ones. Next is hospitalist. And hospitalist medicine, for the most part, especially in big academic centers, is usually done by an internal medicine doctor working in the hospital. So once you go into the emergency department and you see the emergency doctor, then you get transferred to the hospital, you get a bed, and then you know that doctor that shows up every single day to check on you and order tests and coordinate care? That is a hospitalist for any non-medical um, individuals that are watching this video. And it will be your job basically to round every morning on the patient's review lab values, uh, check in with medications, see how the patient is doing, arrange for discharge, coordinate care. You are working in the hospital and there are many benefits of choosing to work in this way. Number one, overhead is covered by the hospital. Uh, number two, you don't have to worry about doing things on a longitudinal basis. You see the patients only that are admitted in the hospital until they're discharged. You're not gonna have to follow up on them later. And finally, similar to locum work, you, depending on your contract, don't have to necessarily work the entire year. Like a hospitalist might only work two weeks out of a month and then take some time off and then come back the next month. You arrange shifts depending on what hospital you work at and you negotiate contracts with whoever it is that's currently trying to find a doctor to cover that particular center. And finally, this last one I think is really interesting. This is fly-in medicine or a fly-in locum, working in some of the parts of the country that are inaccessible by most means and really do require you to fly in for about a week at a time, two weeks at a time in some cases. And for the most part, we are looking at areas that don't really have good access to central infrastructure. The hospitals might be really small and non-existent at all. And for the most part, a lot of care in these places on a weekly basis 
are so deprived of medical doctors that care for the most part is supplied almost entirely by nurses in many cases. And the way contracts usually work, like I said, about a week at a time for the most part, you will divide up what you're doing. And, and if you're going to do fly-in medicine, these positions are reserved for family medicine doctors that are really just true generalists. Like you need to have the training to be able to work emergency medicine, to be able to work clinic, to be able to work in some cases OB and do a few other things as well, make some house calls, work with addictions medicine. It really is the jack of all trades. Do it all because you are the only doctor in this area. This may include areas where there are no general surgeons, no OBs, and as a result, you have places where there are family doctors that have even been trained to do C-section procedures. And yes, this is one of the things with additional training, but they're not all like that. In any case, these are options that are very lucrative but can be very taxing on your own schedule. And usually people that do fly-ins, either they could choose to have their own clinic in like Toronto, for example, and will do one week out of a month where they fly into either Kenora or Sioux Lookout or another community like this. And for the most part, the people that coordinate these fly-in locums will arrange for housing and help with food and travel costs as well. It is a good way to get into working some of these um, really adventurous type of jobs right out of residency. Like a lot of people that are interested in these more adventurous positions do start pretty much right away and will set you up for a very long career with being a very properly trained generalist. All right, now those are some of the, the most common ones that I've heard of that I've been offered positions in already that some of my friends have talked to me about as well. I will say that there are many other opportunities that, and even more that become available with formal additional training. Like for the most part, anesthesia, family doctors that choose to do an additional year in anesthesiology will tend to run the anesthesiology programs. I, I think there are still places where you might have someone without that additional plus one doing anesthesiology, but it is becoming less and less frequent, I would say, as time goes on. But really, um, you know, you could get into sports medicine, you could get into psychiatry, additional training. And, and, uh, really guys, until I was at this point, I, I didn't really know just how much work there is to be done and how desperate many of these places are trying to find qualified people, but not just that, people that actually want to work. And, and that might be one of the biggest problems right now. Um, you know, a lot of newly graduated doctors not necessarily wanting to get into full-time work right away. And, and there are different reasons why this is the case. I'm not really trying to put anyone down here, but I'm just saying that, you know, never ever have I come out and, and told you guys that I am concerned that I'm not gonna be making enough money in my profession. I know a lot of people complain about family medicine, saying that you don't make the most. And, you know, I, I really, I, I've seen that there are doctors that, that are definitely struggling to get by financially. They're not, not billing as much as some of the specialists, but there's so much work to be done. And I, I think, that if you are able to capitalize on that, and if you're ready to put in some major hours in the week, just like you would if you were a surgeon or an intensivist or any of these other high paying specialties, you're gonna do fine for yourself. And I'm sure about that, but this, this is not a money talk here today. And I say that, but then I, I have to stop and, and think again that, you know, like if, if I don't have this talk with you guys, then, then who will? Who, who are you gonna ask these questions to? Like, who was I able to ask these questions through going through medical school? And I think that's a big problem. So let's just, you know, the reason why it's hard is more so because it's variable depending on where you're working, what you're doing, the hours you're putting in. Are those hours in the daytime or are they at nighttime? If you are going to be putting in full-time work, and I'm talking 50 to 70 hours per week, or even more than that in some cases, I would be shocked to see people that made less than $350,000 per year after overhead, but before taxes, obviously. And on an upper end of the spectrum, yes, I've seen family doctors pushing over 600,000, definitely. If they're the types that are working surgeon hours and, and rightfully so, like you're never gonna have me say that I want to work part-time and then get mad at people that make more money than me that are working twice as many hours as me. but. That's just my thoughts. You guys might, you know, rebuttal me in the, in the comment section below and that's fine. But uh, for those of you that are interested, yes, the more you work in medicine, the better you will do. If you invest properly and safely and you're not taking major risks unnecessarily, um, you, you're gonna be okay in family medicine. And I think that a lot of times this gets blown way out of proportion. And when I am staff, we'll talk about some actual concrete numbers. But personally, I've decided against sharing that right now 
just because, I don't know, maybe when I'm staffed, the numbers that I have in mind right now won't actually be the case. So we'll hold off just for a little bit longer. But all right, everyone, that's all I have for today's video. I, I feel like I rambled a little bit in here, but I just wanted to get, you know, like an informal discussion going uh, and, and we'll keep it going in the comment section below. If anyone's interested in family medicine, because I guess that's who's going to be watching these videos, anyone that wants to learn a little bit more about what it's like to get into the field, that's my central goal, I think, moving forward with a lot of this stuff. Um, trying to get more people into family medicine. Like, I don't see it a bad thing in any way to get the most qualified, smartest applicants possible interested in this, in this profession. It was my first choice because I knew that I could carve out an amazing life for myself doing something that I love. And that's why I'm here right now. And I want you guys to feel that way too. So any questions for future talks, put them down in the comment section below. We'll get around to them. Best of luck with residency applications if you're there right now. Doesn't matter what you're applying to, I want you to feel happy with that decision, no matter where you end up. And with that, good luck everyone. We'll see you all in the next one. Everyone take care.